One of the biggest challenges facing already stretched health services across Europe will be the increase in the ageing population, especially those over the age of 75. Lung disease has emerged as an age-related disease. Uh, previously, it was mainly seen as like neurological disorders, cardiovascular disorders, and metabolic diseases. So in particular, we see a rise in patients with COPD, IPF, and also with lung cancer. We will see more chronic diseases. That group of individuals are older and have multimorbidities and are frail. That's a real problem. We're oversubscribed in terms of beds all the time in this hospital and that is due to inability to get people out quickly because of these other these problems. I think elderly population really causes a huge challenge for healthcare system and there are important things here. If healthy living can be ensured that's the best for everybody. If independence can be saved for longer in lifetime that's very important and if there is burden of a disease or burden of many diseases which happens in an elderly situation, to minimize the burden of these diseases, that's a major challenge. We know that patients is over 75 start to have uh, uh, several diseases at the same time, and we still do not know if this happens because of age, because one disease can influence the onset of other diseases, or if uh, uh, there is something that we still do not understand. There's a, a lack of recognition about comorbidities in conditions such as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and COPD. There have been uh, lots of studies which have shown that there's under recognition, particularly of cardiovascular disease, for example, in this group. And it's not uh, very difficult to realise the reason for this. I mean, the symptoms are kind of the same, particularly the breathlessness. We saw that, for example, mainly cardiovascular diseases. Heart failure is the first one, hypertension, coronary disease are frequent in COPD patients. We have also seen that there is a high prevalence of uh, depression, high prevalence of osteoporosis, mainly in women, high presence of metabolic diseases, mainly diabetes. And we do know that many of our COPD patients do not die due to COPD. They die of the cardiovascular disease, one of them, or lung cancer. It's a good quarter of them who dies of lung cancer. Of course, we have an, uh, a high sort of hospitalization rate in those patients, and um, that, of course, causes an increased health burden and society burden as well. Dealing with elderly patients who are often frail and suffering with comorbidities raises numerous questions about the most appropriate and safe treatments. It's very important for this elderly population to understand that first of all if they are, have multimorbidity they most likely are prescribed with 10 plus different medication and we do not know exactly their interaction and their potentials, what works and how it works. Many of them never been trialed for the population in 75 plus, so it's very hard to make a very good decision what is needed and what is not. And many times we operate on the same system, like when you, we provide beta-2 agonists to the patients with COPD to dilate their airways, our cardiac friends will offer them beta-1 antagonist to help the heart rate. There's been a huge reluctance to treat heart failure or cardiovascular disease with drugs called beta blockers, which are commonly used in this condition because of the fear, totally unfounded, with the lack of no evidence to support this, that you might worsen the airways obstruction in these individuals. There's no real good evidence for that. So there's been a, an under prescription in these patients. And again, any other treatments, for example, theophilins, which are given uh, for in COPD in some occasions can interact with lots of other different types of drugs like antibiotics, which are also given. So there's a kind of reluctance to, um, to treat these comorbidities um, with drugs that might interfere with the, with, uh, the drugs they're get, getting for their respiratory condition. When we can't uh, heal the disease, we can control it, we can do something with it, we give a better chance to survive for the patient, less complications and so on. It means that the better we are with this approach, the longer we will be giving this drug. 
And if the drug is expensive, of course, it's going to be a lot and lot expenses. And now we have a lot of uh, very specified drugs developed for a small group of patients for rare diseases and so on with an extremely high price. And that's a huge challenge. And these are very sensitive issues to discuss in an ethical, bioethical level. I think the idea of aging research is not to prolong the lifespan, but to prolong the time of health. It's important really to calculate the increase in lifespan you gain from increasing your exercise, for example. Making it very plain to the public, I think that's what, what's missing, especially with regard to this healthy aging. The link between lung aging and diseases such as COPD and IPF is clear, especially in the growing population of people over 75. But what about younger people whose lungs have aged prematurely? We know that the maturation of the lung continues up to around 20 years of age and then begins a slow decline in lung function over the period of its life. This period can vary according to a number of critical factors such as birth size, exposure to cigarette smoke and genetics. The genetics influence very much the disease development. We have a very good example for COPD and this is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and if the serpent gene area has a mutation which will make the person more prone not to provide a, different, a given molecule to the body, in this case elastolysis occurs and emphysema develops faster. So these are the people who develop COPD at an early age. And in IPF, similarly, there are uh, mutations in uh, polymorphisms in the MUC5 gene, for example, or all our telomeres or genes and so on, which again make it more at risk both, both for sporadic, what's called sporadic IPF, or familial, because there's a familial component to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But apart from those, we don't have a good biomarker that says, for example, you're the one that's going to age your lung more. There is basically a very conserved pathway of aging. It's not one pathway, it's many pathways. And all these pathways have been shown to not only be affected during aging, but when you sort of modify them, they induce and propagate aging. This is not just a byproduct that they are activating in aging, but that they are really causing aging when you disturb them. We can nowadays get an idea about um, signatures of aging and maybe also in different groups of patients whether they have like an early onset of uh, defined aging signature which we might easily check in, in the blood maybe. So we use that as a biomarker to stratify patients later on and then also treat them differently. What we really need is something and I, I'm not suggesting which basic mechanism we're going to target, but some, something to target that would reduce the decline in that, in that condition. So that at an early stage of the disease, we could give something that would prevent further decline. One, that's one thing. Second thing, of course, is regeneration of the lung. A part of the aging process is also the exhaustion of stem cells and dysfunctional stem cells. So this of course can be something where we could sort of try to target stem cell function, reactivate stem cells, and it's more or less in line with all the other regenerative uh, processes we would uh, like to achieve. Um, and we could with that maybe also um, yeah, rewind the wheel a bit. Um, by targeting the stem cells and reactivating pathways um, that are maybe uh, deficient in, in the aging uh, uh, patient. There are lots of problems, but I think there's hope that um, interfering with basic processes, repairing the lung, uh, may well be possible in the future.